Hello, welcome to the Thinkers 50 Radar 2023 series, brought to you in partnership with Deloitte. I'm Des Dearlove. And I'm Stuart Craner, and we're the founders of Thinkers 50. For more than 20 years, Thinkers 50 has been identifying, ranking and sharing extraordinary business and management ideas. Every January, we announce 30 management and business thinkers to watch in the coming year. These are the new and exciting voices of management. The result for 2023 is an eclectic group of people who we believe will make an impact with their ideas, their campaigning, their research and their passion in the coming 12 months. More than that, by showcasing their ideas, we hope they will be inspired to carry the torch for management thinking in the years ahead. Uh, they don't have all the answers, but they are asking important questions. And talking of questions, we welcome yours at any time during the session. And also, please let us know where you are joining from today. Send over your thoughts and questions, insights, queries at any time during the session. And today we are delighted to be joined by Marcus Collins. Marcus is the Chief Strategy Officer at the International Creative Agency, Biden and Kennedy, New York, and Clinical Marketing Professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. His new book is Essential Reading and is entitled For the Culture, The Power Behind What We Buy, What We Do, and Who We Want to Be. Came out on May the 2nd from Public Affairs. Marcus, Marcus is also a member of the Thinkers 50 Radar Class of 2023. Prior to his work in advertising, Marcus worked in music and tech as a startup, co-founder for Muse Recordings, then led iTunes and Nike Sport music initiatives at Apple. Before running digital strategy for Beyonce. Marcus, welcome. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me here. You're very welcome. Um, fascinating um, bio, fascinating CV, and congratulations on the book. That's your first book. This is my first book, and uh, I couldn't be more excited about it. I'm really proud of, of um, the thinking that came out of it, but more importantly, I'm really um, encouraged and optimistic about its ability to help people. Well, we're going to talk about the book, obviously. We're going to talk about the book, but tell us a little bit about your journey, how you, how you kind of got here. And I mean, as, as we indicated with your, with your CV, you've had some you know, interesting um, twists and turns along the way. It's been a long and winding road, as they <laughs> say. Um, I, I'm from Detroit, born and raised. I always start that way because I feel like I'm a product of the city. Um, I went to University of Michigan undergrad to study materials engineering because I thought that polymers were really cool. Um, I don't know if I, that's how I describe polymers today, but they certainly were interesting. That's for sure. Um, I studied engineering undergrad, uh, but I really wanted to be a musician. I really wanted to be a songwriter, much to my parents' chagrin. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from undergrad, um, I went into the music industry and I was a songwriter for a living. I did a startup with another ex-engineer from the University of Michigan. He took care of the business side. I took care of all the, 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 the music production. Um, and we were kind of successful until we weren't because the music industry is riddled with uh, many inefficiencies, which led to its disruption in uh, the, the, the early 2000s. So I went back to school to get my MBA to figure out this disruption that was happening in music that we call digital. From there, I went to go uh, work at Apple doing partner marketing at iTunes. Um, and then I ended up meeting Matthew Knowles, who's Beyonce's father. And he says to me, okay, well, let me get this straight. You're an engineer, you started a music company, you have an MBA, you work at iTunes, and you're black. Dude, you're not real. You're a unicorn. You don't exist. I go, no, I'm real. I'm, I'm a real person. I'm, I'm human. And he says, well, you should run digital strategy for Beyonce. And I said, yes, sir, you're absolutely correct. I should do that. And I got a chance to work with Beyonce during the I Am Sasha Fierce days, which for me, I describe as the, the moment in time where she went from being Beyonce the artist to being Queen B, as we describe her today. Um, and that was just a really rewarding experience because you typically don't get a front row seat to that sort of transcendence. And I was able to not only observe it, but in small ways contribute to it. But over time, I realized um, that the world of digital and social that I was occupying on the music side uh, was far greater than the scope in which music were thinking about it in those days, talking 2010, 2009. So I went into advertising because they were doing a better job of breaking music, breaking new artists. You think um, iTunes uh, commercials with like Matt and Kim, Feist and, and, and the like. Um, and not only that, but I just felt like the, the reach was, was greater. The impact could be greater. 
So I went into advertising, pure play social media agency, then went to go work with Steve Stout at Translation, which is really where I cut my teeth and started to explore this idea of culture, a word that we always use in my field, but didn't really understand, I being one of them. And as I started to excavate this world of the social sciences, it changed my perspective. It rang a bell that I couldn't unring. Um, and I started to invest myself into the social sciences and then started teaching. And over a while, I realized that the perfect place was at this convergence of academia and practice, bridging the academic practitioner gap. Fast forward, you know, a decade later, yada, 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 here I am. And that's the sweet spot for us as well. For Thinkers 50, we always we always think, you know, we, it's it's the overlap between the, the the sort of the academic and the research side and the practitioners that, that we find so exciting. Exactly. That's so why I find myself in, in, in really good company and grateful to be a part of the Thinkers 50. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marcus, when you were working with Beyonce, so you, you had previously been a songwriter. You must have tried out some of your songs with Beyonce. You know, I tried my best. Oh, okay. I tried my very, very best to say, hey, I got some ideas. But, you know, working in that organization, work with Matthew Knowles, it was very, very clear that you had swim lanes and you stay in your swim lane. And that part of business, I never I never had a chance to even you know be in the studio with her or be a part of the creation, which is interesting because when I was at translation, when I was at uh, iTunes, I felt like I was so far uh, down the value chain, if you will. I was so downstream with, I just feel like I was a, a retailer, which is interesting because sometimes iTunes acted as a marketer, but by and large, we were a retailer. And I said, I just want to get closer to the content. And I thought that being on the artist side, that I might be able to sit in both worlds, uh, but by and large, I didn't touch any of the content creation side. And maybe it's for the better because her music is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's done quite well with the songwriters. She's yeah, got exactly. yeah. I don't think she needed me. I don't think she needed me. <laughs> so so what, what did you get out of that experience then? What, what, what surprised you? Because you, kind of, you were in that world just about, and then, but then you worked with a megastar like Beyonce. What, what, what surprised you about it? And what did you get out of it? So there's a few things that surprised me. And, and I think the biggest learning was... Um, was an insight that I've taken with me since then. I think the biggest surprise for me was just how lopsided that industry is. You got the Beyonce's of the world who sit very high and there is a huge Delta between Beyonce and the next, you know, tier down of artists. Um, and they exist in this industry in just very different ways. Um, and I just thought that was kind of eye opening because as a budding songwriter, as a, you know, someone who wanted to be a part of this industry as a creator, I always thought that it was about just merit. It was a meritocracy. Like the good songs are the ones who get picked and the good songs are the ones who get played on the radio, but there's much, much more to it than that. And I just, I guess I would suppose I was naive about that. Um, and then you find instances where someone is terribly talented, just unbelievably out of this world talented with amazing products in their, in their music. Um, and they find themselves at the right place at the right time. And sort of the, the universe just conspires on their behalf. And you see someone like Beyonce, you go, oh, I get it. <laughs> it becomes very, very apparent of where I am and where, where she is. So that, that was kind of eye-opening. But I think the biggest learning actually came from my biggest failure, I think, uh, at least working with her. A part of my job, my remit, was about moving her offline fan club online. Right? How do we engage fans in this world that we call digital and, and, and social? It was pretty primitive the way we talked about it in those days, particularly in, the, in the, the, uh, the, the world of music. But I thought it was a pretty easy thing to do. This is 2009, so you got Facebook and you got Twitter. Pff, easy peasy. I'll just reach out to people who love her. Just say, hey, Beyonce has this thing. She has a party. Come on over to the party if you love Beyonce. And we, we, we kicked this thing off uh, and... It was a party no one showed up to relative to her stardom, relative to her stature as a celebrity, as an entertainer, um, and as a musician. And we're all scratching our heads saying, what's going on? Why is this thing working? What's going on? This should be an easy thing. We turn the lights and people show up. We're trying to build a community here, build this fan club. And as the team started to look across the social web to get a sense of what's happening, you know, there was this, uh, this group of people in the recesses of the web that referred to themselves as the beehive. And these folks had their own set of beliefs, their own set of artifacts, language, behaviors, but they all shared a similar ideology to Beyonce. 
and that they believed in women's empowerment. Beyonce as an artist, as a person, as a brand, everything about Beyonce since the very first day we met her with Destiny's Child has been all about women's empowerment. When it was, no, 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 can you pay my bills? Survivor to the left, you know, um, uh, who runs the world? Girls, get information to, you ain't gonna break my soul. She's been all about this since day one. And this community of people, they assemble because of that shared ideology. And we said to ourselves, oh, we're doing the wrong thing here. The team said, we should cut bait on this community we're trying to build and facilitate the community that already exists. Mm -hmm. And that completely changed my outlook going for forward as a practitioner, even to today. So when we talk about the power of communities, you don't build community, you facilitate them. You serve them. You help facilitate the connections that, that that bring them together. You help mitigate the points of friction that keep them from realizing and achieving the things that they set they 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 seek after, and that was just so revealing for me. And as I look back on my training as a as an engineer, I say training with air quotes. <laughs> training as an engineer, you know, I like polymers because they're all about connections, things connecting through a shared affinity for electrons, right? These carbon chains that came together because they loved electrons. The same thing I liked about music is that people mm -hmm. come together because they shared affinity for an artist or for a song or for a lyric. And the same thing happens when it comes to brands, right? That we connect through these vessels of meaning because we share a similar ideology. And that for me, has just been invaluable um, as I think about my work as a practitioner and even as an academic. Mm. You, I mean, let's just sort of broaden out from there. I mean, you say you study cultural contagion and meaning making to help bridge the academic practitioner gap for companies that aim to put ideas in the world that inspire people. Some of that is in what you've just been talking about. But when you, and obviously the book's all about culture, and I know you, you and I have talked about culture and what it means and how it defines us in a certain way. But what is, what is cultural contagion? How does, that, how does that kind of idea work? So we know culture is. like Culture, um, it's the, the set of expectations and conventions that demarcate who people are and what is acceptable for people like them, right? The beliefs, artifacts, behaviors, and language the system of systems that govern what it means to be a particular group of people, right? It's the, the governing operating system for humanity. So that is culture. So what is cultural contagion? Well, contagion is the spread of ideas, products, messages, behaviors, and the like. So when we talk about cultural contagion. We mean the spread of these conventions and expectations among a group of people through direct or indirect peer influence. That changes our that has an impact on our affects, behaviors, cognitions, and desires. And as a result, we behave accordingly. As a result, we believe accordingly. As a result, we speak accordingly. As a result, we don a certain set of, of artifacts because people like me do something like this. And you know, oftentimes we would use contagion and virality interchangeably, but those two things are not the same. Right, virality um, is the notion of a lot of people have seen it, and people have seen it in this sort of exponential uh, sort of way, and it passes along like a pathogen does. But mm -hmm. pathogens spread through simple contagion, right? If you and I are, are, are in a room together and I sneeze, the likelihood of you getting sick is very, very high, right? If you are exposed to some droplets of pathogen that is within me, then your chances of adopting them is high. However, when it comes to behavior, affects, uh, uh, cognitions, and desires, those aren't the same thing. You could see someone wear a hat and go, that person looks crazy, and it has no effect on you. But when you see 10 people wearing that hat, and those 10 people are your people, you go, whoa, this is a thing. You're more likely to be- I need to get a hat. Exactly, thinking. exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. That everybody, is, else, everybody else who's like me has got a hat. Exactly. So that's complex sure. contagion. Yeah. And okay. social and, and cultural contagion um, happens through complex contagion, through redundant exposures, right? That become signals to your point that I got to do a thing because people like me do something like this. We've got so, people. So, 
Go on, Stuart. Sorry. We've got people watching from Tunisia, the US, UK, India, Spain, uh, and many other places. So please send in your questions or comments for Marcus at any time. Um, Marcus, it strikes me the branding. I think it was P&G introduced kind of brand management in the 1930s. And over the period since then, the kind of best part of 100 years, we've been adding, it seems to each decade, we add a layer of complexity and understanding of it. It's one of those things we're not kind of... Uh, Kind of unpeeling an onion. We're adding more layers, layers to the onion, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, and it, and now you're relating brand branding to our aspirations in a, in, a, in a very deep way. And it's really really interesting about the way branding is evolving and our understanding of it. Yeah, well, branding to your point has evolved quite a bit. If we think about the first uh, trademark brand, the early trade earliest trademark brand uh, comes from Josiah Wedgwood who created pottery in the 1700s. And he brought his pottery to market and to make sure that his pottery wasn't mistaken with someone else's pottery, he put his name on it. Right? And by that, he turned brand, which which essentially is a mark of ownership, into a legal mark, right? So that brand mark, that vessel of meaning became a legal mark to say that that pottery belongs to, to, to Wedgwood. Fast forward two and a half centuries later, to your point, Stuart, Marketers said, you know what, if we start leveraging more of what we know of how people cognate their psychology, we can get people to buy more. So what did marketers do? We started leveraging psychology into our marketing communications. We got value propositions, uh, positioning statements. We started using associations, right? Here in the States, we often uh, would associate Coca-Cola and Santa Claus together, red and white, right? Those associations breed familiarity, which lead to trust. And at that time, brands transcended from being a legal mark to being a trust mark. There's that saying, no one's ever got fired for hiring IBM. That's the idea that you can trust it. 30 years later, again, we're pulling back that, 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 that onion. So we're pulling it back. 30 years later, in the 1980s, marketers said, you know what? It's not enough people just to buy our stuff. We want to develop relationships with people. We want people to love us. So marketers started to tell stories, these big, robust narratives where the brand was essentially a character in a broader story in an effort to evoke emotion within people and people will love them. Sachi Sachi referred to these as love marks. So brand went from legal mark to trust mark to love mark. Today, I would argue that the most powerful brands leverage culture as a vehicle to influence people to consume because people not only consume because of its utility, but they consume for psychological and sociological impulses, right? As a way of signaling who I am, where the brand becomes a mark of identity, not because of what it is, but because who I am and who I want to be. And the most powerful brands navigate through culture, these systems of expectations and conventions uh, of what people uh, of, like us do as a way to become a mark of ownership. And if that be the case, if you're with me there, I think that uh, the future becomes very clear that if the most powerful brands today leverage culture where consumption is a cultural act, I, what I buy, what I wear, what I drive, where I go to school, if I go to school, who I marry, if I marry, where I bury the dead, if you bury the dead, these things are byproducts of what people like me do, then the future of brand will be about facilitating community because I identify a certain way. I want to find people who are like myself. So let's just unpack this a little bit. So make sure we've, we've got the, we've grasped it. So I, I wouldn't buy a Ferrari necessarily to get from A to B. I buy a Ferrari to make a statement that I'm, I hang out with people with Ferraris. Right. To signal where I am in the social, social hierarchy. I mean, if you look at yeah. the, the concept of consumption uh, back in the 16th century, the Elizabethan England, you know, were, was catalyzed by a want for aggrandizement, a way of signaling where I am in a social hierarchy in effort to, to have power, right? Um, and so is the same today. We use these, these branded products not merely because of their, uh, their utilitarian benefit, but because of what it says about me to the world, how I peacock myself to the world, uh, but also to uh, to satiate psychological wants and needs to feel like I'm a part of something uh, far greater than myself. 
I like the, the phrase you use in relation to Wedgwood, a vessel of meaning. And we should, we should point out that uh, Wedgwood was a, a branding pioneer and he's British. He might have been the last British branding pioneer. <laughs> but, but, and, and, now, and now you're, you're referring to Elizabethan consumption habits. So it's good to see that Britain in, was involved. Well, yeah, Queen Elizabeth yeah. first invented consumption, apparently. So, yeah, that's good. Um, and language. You, I, I've heard you talk about language as a cultural phenomenon and denominator. How does it took us a little bit about that? Language a way of sig is a way of signaling in very short uh, and very shorthand that you're one of us. When people talk, we go, oh, I get a sense of A, where you are, your accent. B, when you use certain vernacular, it signals that you are part of certain communities, right? Like, you know, think about location beyond your, your accent. I'm from Detroit. And the way we greet people from Detroit, we say, what up, though? So if I say, hey, Stuart, I'm Marcus. Great to meet you. And Stuart goes, what up, though? I go, are you from Detroit? You must be from Detroit because this is what we do. I think that's uh, unlikely that Stuart would greet you in that way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but in, in Philadelphia, they use the word John to describe everything. It's a John or that John. Like that, that language uh, becomes a way of signaling that you're one of us. And you see this in organizations and communities and in, in, in institutions as well. We have jargon, we have uh, abbreviations, we have short shorthand, uh, we have colloquialisms, the slang. That's a way of saying that you are part of the community, right? And if you think of yourself at, um, if you're speaking to a potential client or you're at a corporate talk, uh, talk and the speaker is using language that doesn't feel like, he, he gets us, you go, oh, what's this guy doing? But if someone starts talking and they start using all the vernacular of your industry, you go, uh, th this, this lady knows what's up. And this is a way of signaling that you're, you're one of us, right? They are, they are outward expressions of an inward subscription. And that subscription is cultural in nature. You, you don't like the word consumers, Marcus. <laughs> can you explain? We were talking about language. Can you can you explain that? Sure. I use I use the word consumers just so that I'm speaking the language, just so that I am, uh, <laughs> so that I you know I, I I communicate the signal that I'm one of us. But I think that consumers are just a trite way to describe people. Consumers speak to kind of what we do. We consume. We waste away. But they don't really describe who we are, right? And we often think about consumers in this sort of abstract uh, 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 is abstract sort of uh, manifestation that they're like machines that eat messages and crap cash. Like just talk to consumers and consumers will consume, just yell at them and they'll act. But we are so much more complicated than that, right? We're human beings. I like the way uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson puts it. He's an astrophysicist. He says, um, when human behavior enters the equation, that's why things go non-linear. That's why physics is easy and sociology is hard because we are complex. I mean, Sir Isaac Newton said, I can study the heavenly bodies, but cannot conceive the madness of humanity. And it's true. We are very, very complex. And when we strip away that complexity of who we are, we strip away our humanity. And it's about understanding sort of the idiosyncrasies that govern how we as a species tick. But more importantly, or more specifically rather, how people like me navigate through the world because of the conventions and expectations that are that are uh, acceptable for people like me, my cultural uh, my cultural characteristics, why I see the world the way I do informs why I behave in the world the way I do. And for marketers to interact with people in a meaningful way, in a human way, if we keep looking at them as only consumers that waste away, but not as the social animals that are in search of belonging, then the search of feeling connected, then I think that our ability to actually make connections will be uh, hamstringed. And I guess if we're if we're just consumers, we're not co-creators. We're not we're not we're not adding to the sum total of humanity as well. We're just seen as as these rapacious um, organisms. That's right. I mean, I, I even I even don't love the idea of audiences either, because audiences have, to your point, Des, a very similar connotation. Audiences they sit passively and just wait to, for messages to wave over them. When I go to the movie theater, I'm an audience member. I'm sitting there saying, "Entertain me." 
When I go to the theater, I'm an audience member saying, entertain me. When I go to a talk, I'm an audience member saying, entertain me. Not, I won't agree with that. <laughs> or that's not cool. <laughs> or watch out, he's going to kill you when I'm at the movies. You know, like we, we, we don't do these things. At least it's not you know, terribly acceptable for us to do those things. Because audiences are meant to watch, to observe. But we, we want to co-create. We, we want to contribute. We want to have a part uh, uh, in the manner, especially for things that are meaningful for us. Uh, that is an issue with theatres in, in the UK, certainly, uh, people getting involved. <laughs> yeah, that's right. it, it's actually a tr- uh, Since the, the pandemic, people's appetite for getting involved in uh, singing in the theatre and expressing their opinions has, has, has grown. That's yeah. right. Let, let, let's, let's move some questions from our audience. <laughs> the uh, minor emp- employer who's... I, I think uh, from memory, I think is in Brussels, uh, says he's interested in Marcus's opinion on the place of purpose in the evolution of brand beyond the cultural dimension. Yeah. You know, I mean, that that's what this is all about, isn't it? Branding, yeah. it's not about wearing hats. It gives you purpose. That's right. So, I mean, it's still, you, 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 were, you already kind of spoke this a little bit that I would argue that brands by nature have a purpose. Like they, they already have a purpose. So when we talk about the brand's purpose, I think it's not the best nomenclature because we find ourselves in the world of extract, extraction. So let's get to some specificity. What is a brand? A brand is an identifiable signifier that conjures up thoughts and feelings in the hearts and minds of people in association to a company, a product, institution, organization, or person, right? It's a signifier. It means something. And that meaning activates conjures up, evokes emotions and and cognitions. So marketers use brands, these these, uh, signifiers that evoke emotions and cognitions because emotions lead to behavioral adoption, right? The part of the brain associated with emotions, the limbic system is also associated uh, with emotions, right? Uh, Behavior and emotions reside or associate the same part of the brain. So activating those two things together increased the likelihood of getting people to move, which is the core function of marketing, getting people to adopt behavior. By this, vote for him, uh, wear a mask, listen to that kind of music, download this, subscribe, et cetera. So the purpose of brand is to conjure up thoughts and feelings within people to increase their likelihood of consuming, of moving, of adopting behavior. That is the purpose of brand. But what we ask ourselves, we should be asking ourselves is, what does the brand want to mean? That vessel of meaning that conjures up thoughts and feelings, what do we want to signify? Do we want to signify the product that we create in hopes that people see our product and go, that's a sharp razor. Those are the thoughts and feelings that are conjured up when I think about that product and I'm going to consume because of its value propositions, because that razor is so sharp. Or, or, Do we want to transcend the value propositions and operate at a level that's far higher and far more evocative, I would argue, which I would say is ideology, conviction, how the brand sees the world, that the brand sees the world um, at a point of view that's beyond what it produces, but it sees the world through the lens of its beliefs, its driving conviction, right? Nike is a perfect example of this. Nike believes that every human body is an athlete. It just so happened to make sneakers. They believe that every human body is an athlete. So everything Nike does is to help people realize their best athletic self. They do it through their products, be they shoes, be they uh, 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 apparel, accessories, technology, or whatever category they want to be into. They do these things in an effort to help people realize their best athletic self, right? So when we think about Nike, we don't think about just sneakers. We think about all these other things that are associated, tangential, to that signifier, right? Uh, but when we think about, I don't know, let's say uh, the Westin Hotel, we think hotels, a nice hotel, but a hotel. But if I told you that Nike was opening up a new hotel in, in Times Square, you go, I think I can understand what that hotel might look like. I know kind of what the, what the aesthetic would be and sort of how things are going to look in there. But if I told you that the Westin were going to make a sneaker, you wouldn't have any clue what that looks like because the meaning associated to those brands, one resides at the product and value proposition level, the Westin, 
and the other one lives at a higher level, an ideological level. And people who see the world similarly, they share the same ideology of the brand. They consume the brand, not because of what the brand is and what they create, but because of who those people are and how they see the world in an ideological congruent way. We've got some more questions coming in and we, we want to make this as interactive and not have a passive audience. So um, <laughs> to, yeah, to what extent does this stuff apply? You know, we're talking using culture in its broadest sense, but obviously there are different sort of international cultures. So we've got a question from Elizabeth. How do you see markets being different based on individualistic versus collectivist cultures and hierarchical versus egalitarian cultures? Yes, yes. So I mean, it's it's a perfect question, Elizabeth, and you sort of answer it in, in the question itself, that cultures vary, right? They, they live by different meaning systems. And because of that, the way things manifest within these cultures are going to be different. For instance, um, for some, a cow is leather, for others, it's a deity, and for some, it's dinner. Which one is it? It's all of them for those particular group of people. So some consume for this, some consume for that, and some consume in other ways. Why? Not because of what it is, but because of who we are. Raymond Williams, um, um, an, an, another another guy from the UK, lots of UK love today, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Raymond Williams, uh, one of the just breakthrough scholar uh, in sociology, particularly in cultural studies. You know, he defines culture as a realized signifying system. I just love that phrase. Um, and since he's way smarter than me, I sort of decode that and say that culture is a realized meaning making system. It's the way by which we make meaning. So whether you are in a hierarchical, egalitarian, uh, um, or a democratic uh, uh, society, whether you're in a religious society or, um, or sort of a, an atheist driven society, whatever the context may be, you make meaning through those cultural lenses and the way you engage with brands and branded products, as well as organizations, institutions, and the like, those things are going to be governed by those cultural characteristics, which means then for marketers, leaders, activists, politicians, uh, uh, um, clergy, and the like, that you have to understand the cultural characteristics of those people with great, great intimacy, such that you're able to understand how they make meaning and and then decode how you might be able to contribute, interact, and activate those people within those cultural frames. There's, there's, a, couple, there's a comment from somebody on LinkedIn saying tribalism driver. That's right. That's right. I mean, and I, I just wanted to say it because I'm not really sure what it means, but does it, does it mean something, Marcus? Yes. Yes. I mean, we talked about the future of brand would be communal in nature, where these brand marks will act as tribal marks as a way of signaling who I am, not as an individual, but who we are as a collective, right? So we see this in politics all the time. And here in the States, we say, you know, it's, we say it's tribal politics. We say, and it's like, yeah, exactly. Like people not only vote because of what people like them do, but they see the world, they translate the world through these cultural frames of what people like them do. Not only that, but they consume the cultural production of people like them. Right. If you're on the left or if you're on the right, you watch Fox News. If you're on the left, you watch MSNBC. And if you ever were to crisscross, when you looked at that program and you go, those people are crazy. Why? Because they see the world through different meaning making systems. Now, the, the thing to take away, though, is that is it are they wrong? Maybe. Is it leather? Is it dinner or is it deity? It's all three. The thing is that these people are living by different meaning systems that is normalized within their subculture, within their community, within their tribe. Understanding those things will help us better understand them and ultimately be able to activate them. Okay, got a question from somebody joining us from LinkedIn. Do I mean, I, which I think kind of kind of relates to the point you were you were just making in the sort of political sphere and particularly sort of the echo chamber effect. Do brands have some responsibility to not add fuel to societal political ideologies in their zeal to sell? Yeah. Are, I, are there, is there so an I, ethical, yeah. yeah. So I write about this in the book um, and, and, and maybe, you know, maybe it's even worth expanding even more. But ultimately, the ideas that I've put forward, the ideas that I write about in the book, they're really, they're value neutral. They're not good or bad. They just are. 
right? We're looking at the underlying physics of human behavior and how these things uh, impact us and how we how we act accordingly as as a group, as a community, as a tribe, as a network tribe. Um, but the 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 charge that I leave the reader with is that because these things are value neutral, they are now up to ethics. Their 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 usage. Now that you have the power, um, as Uncle Ben would say, with great power comes great responsibility. Now with this this power, you you now yield with the ability to influence people. It should be used for good, but what is good? And that and that in in and of itself is an ethical question. So I leave the reader with the rubric that I use, having spent so many years as a practitioner in evaluating evaluating what I think is ethically right. I call it IPL because it's clever, right? IPL is uh, intention, perspective, and outcome. So I start with what are my intentions for doing this thing? My intentions, like, am I doing this because I think it's going to be good? Do I, am I doing this because I think that I'm adding value, right? And and one may say that that is a very myopic view of seeing the world. And you're right. I'm looking at the world through my lens as saying, Marcus, why am I engaging in this thing? Are my intentions malicious? Are they nefarious in nature? Prayerfully, inshallah, they're not, right? But there's not enough just for me to be my perspective. I also need to think about the perspective of other people. So it's my intentionality and then P, perspective. That is, how do other people see the world and how might they see what I do, which requires intimacy, which requires me uh, applying some empathy to how I look at what we might potentially do. And then lastly, I look at what are the potential outcomes? Now, I'm not clairvoyant. I don't have a crystal ball under my my uh, my desk, so I can't see the future, but I can certainly uh, uh, do some approximations of what might be, some estimations, some, some guesstimations. Um, and it's that that the calculus of my intentions, the perspective of others, what potential outcomes are that I say, okay, is this worth doing? Is this morally sound and ethically sound? And, and since we all abide by our own meaning making frames, by our own systems of systems, you know, I leave it to the practitioner, in this case, the reader to make that judgment call. But I will say that if your meaning making system uh, equates to my oppression, then we have a problem. But otherwise, you know, I leave it to the practitioner to make the decisions they feel are best for themselves and for the community, realizing that people's perspective and the potential outcomes should be factored into the, the, the plan. There's a sense listening to you, Marcus, that the, 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 the kind of categories of marketing, market and brand, they feel quite dated now. <laughs> because in, in my mind, I'm probably old, old enough or perhaps too old, but um, marketing used to be about selling stuff in a kind of kind of superficial one dimensional way. And similarly with branding, there's a there's kind of a one dimensional thing, but it's even sophisticated and clever. But it's almost like the language of marketing and, and branding holds us back because what you're talking about is is much more nuanced, behavioral, universal and to do with ethical values and purpose. So it's, so it's something completely different. No, it's totally fair. I mean, if you look at the history of marketing, um, it had long been the practice of economics, right? We use economic theory to understand the market and understand consumer insights, consumer behavior. And the way that we practice economics was marketing. And therefore it was seen through a very, economics driven perspective the market is perfect people are value maximizers and all we care about is maximize their own value until we realize that oh actually people will forego their own individual value for the value of the community well why would anyone do that that doesn't make sense people aren't acting rational so we started studying psychology 1950s 1960s bringing in psychology into to marketing to understand how people cognate and then marketers realized that oh not only do people cognate in ways that are, are that are uh, counterintuitive, but also people act differently or cognate differently with different people. So we need to use psychology or sociology to understand why people or how people act in different institutions, different locations, different environments with different people. And as marketers started doing this in the 1980s, they said, oh, so if we're using psychology, sociology to understand people, 
well, what governs human behavior? Culture. In the 1990s, scholars like uh, Grant McCracken, Douglas Holt, uh, Craig Thompson, um, uh, Schuston, Alexander, like those people started to, to study consumer culture theory as a way to understand the external forces that culture has on our behavior. So to your point, Stuart, we have evolved beyond marketing being a way to sell things, but marketing at its core is going to market to get people to adopt behavior, to vote, to download, to subscribe, to watch, to evangelize, to take a, get a vaccination, to wear a mask, to not wear a mask, to storm the Capitol or all other things that we try to do to get people to adopt behavior. I mean, I'm trying to get my, my eldest daughter to eat peas. She never will do it, right? But I'm, we're constantly trying to influence behavior. And I think that that to me is the most important part about the book. Because I'd say that even if you don't have marketer in your title, we're all trying to influence each other. Right. So the book really isn't a marketing book. It's a people book. And the better we understand people, the more likely we are to not only sell, but to get people to, to move. That's really interesting. It resonates. We we gave a lifetime achievement award to um Phil Kotler a couple of years ago. And he, I mean, you know, the great, yeah, the yeah. great way in of, of of traditional marketing. But Phil's moved on and was talking about this notion of, you know, marketing to can be to persuade people to consume less. It could be, you know, you're marketing to say, this is how you conserve water. This is this right. how you, you do, you know, some of the things you're talking about. So it's very interesting. What would you like? I mean, the, the, the curious thing to me is it's taken you so long to write a book, to be quite honest, because you're obviously full of ideas. What what it, what prompted they prompted you to write the book now? And, and what would you like people to take away from the book? What do you, you know, what, what is the marketing message of the book? What do you want? <laughs> What's the action you want, the behavior you want people to take away from it? I think it's twofold. I, I... I was drawn to write the book because of practical reasons and personal reasons. It's kind of a way to go, in, go in full circle from the beginning of the conversation. The practical reasons that in our industry, everyone was talking about culture, like get our ideas out in the culture. It should be informed by culture, what's happening in culture, 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 culture. And if you asked five people to define culture, you get 25 different answers. That's a problem because if we don't have concrete language, then we can't really operationalize the thing. At least we couldn't do that together. So we need a better Rosetta Stone to describe this amorphous, abstract, uh, esoteric thing that is culture um, so that we can use it and harness its power, right? That was the practical reason. And when I started writing the book and trying to write you know, through a, through a lens of, of my own that felt ownable to me, because there's scholars who are, again, much smarter uh, who, who have explored this thing, but I wanted to find something that was uniquely my own to talk about. And while I was writing the book, I realized there was a personal reason happening here is that at an early age, when I was in high school, I had a pension for math and science in those days in the, the late nineties and the nineties in general, if you did well math and science and you were black, you were going to be an engineer full stop. You didn't have an option. You're going to be an engineer. And that's what I did. I went to engineering because that was what was expected yeah. of yeah. people like me. And when I went into engineering, though I thought it was interesting, it's not what I really wanted to do, but I did it because of the social pressures being pushed on me, the conventions and expectations of people like me. And I didn't have the language to describe what was happening. I just said, my parents are, are bugging out. My parents are, you know, they're, they're putting so much pressure on me, but I didn't realize that my parents actually had their own external forces being pushed on them on what it means to be a good parent, to guide your children to something that's going to have what we thought would be a much more predictable, successful outcome. And because I didn't have the, the right language to describe what was happening, I didn't have very much agency to negotiate, to, to navigate it. It took me 20 plus years to realize that we were all just being influenced by the cultural subscriptions to which we uh, applied our identity and the forces that come along with it. And my earliest decisions as an adult were being influenced by forces that I didn't know where they came from or what they were and therefore i wasn't uh empowered to do anything about it so what do you want people to take from the book so i want people to to a have uh, a better understanding of what culture is have a, be a better rosetta stone to describe this thing but also i want people to have more agency to say i can i can now say oh this is what culture is. When I look at someone, I don't look at them and say, these people are crazy. I go, oh, they're operating by a different meaning-making system. They have these beliefs. It's why they dress the way they do, the way they act the way they do, and they talk the way they do. And I think that if we do that, 
I think we'll just be a bit more empathetic. And perhaps if I'm being, you know, uh, utopic, maybe be a bit more civil, right? And the world might be a better place. Not only be better practitioners, but we just be better citizens on, on this, this, uh, this globe that we co-inhabitate. Well, nice thought to end on. Marcus, yeah. we're, we're out of time. Um, I mean, I presume you've sent a copy to Beyonce. <laughs> I said to our publicist. <laughs> we're, we're so good friends. <laughs> yeah. But re really fascinating book for, for the culture, published by Public Affairs uh, in, in America, uh, Pan Macmillan in, in the UK and elsewhere. It's, it's out now. Uh, and where else can people find out more about your work, Marcus? You can find me online at marktothesea.com. That's M-A-R-C-T-O-T-H-E-C.com and at Mark to the C at all the, the social channels. Check Marcus's work out. It's re really important, really accessible, and will change, change people's behavior and the way they think about it, the mar marketing and branding. Amen. Thank you so much. Marcus, thank you. Next week, we're joined by David Rand from MIT. Uh, David is a bit like Marcus, one of those Renaissance men of uh, business thinking, a cognitive scientist, behavioral economist, and social psychologist. So join us again next week. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.